In the past decade, China has been deeply involved in the economic growth of the African continent. And now, under President Xi Jinping's globalization initiative called One Belt, One Road, it will invest close to a trillion U.S. dollars in building infrastructure all across the globe. And if you're looking at the map, it shows you that Kenya is the main hub for Africa, where it will play a pivotal role in opening up the whole East African region. Both the government and the Chinese companies have made massive investments in Kenya over the past decade. And now the country is far ahead in looking at China as an example for their own development. You can already notice this across business, education, and increasingly in social initiatives as well. We are in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, to look beyond the economic headlines and to witness the force of China globalization. Nairobi was the first city in Africa to open up a Confucius Institute. This is an organization from the Chinese Ministry of Education to promote Chinese language and culture internationally. We're visiting the Confucius Institute while they are celebrating the most important event of the year, Chinese New Year. Why do you study Chinese language and culture? I keep on saying that China is becoming a very important country, very important economic power. If you know that China is the second largest economy in the world today, and therefore getting to know their language and culture is very, very important. We have already enrolled 120 beginners, people who are going to be studying beginners program in Chinese language and culture. That's a big number. We've also got about 20 doing diplomas and about the same numbers doing certificate and proficiency. So Chinese language and culture is becoming very, very popular in Kenya and it will continue to become popular. Chinese government and Kenyan government are building a very strong tie between each other. And the two governments are aware of the importance of establishing this relationship from the long term. I always believe if you are ambitious enough, if you are smart enough, you should pick up Chinese. You will make a difference in your life by picking up Chinese. Now, please follow me. Once again, All right. Some countries such as South Africa have already embedded Chinese into their national school curriculum, and Kenya is kind of on its way to do the same thing. This has been criticized by the local community, who are questioning the motives behind institutions that are pushing the next generation towards China. I know that there may be probably the perception of, you know, a country uh, influencing another country. Uh, through through language acquisition. That is a natural thing, it happens. Some countries have more influence than others and there's, there's, there's nothing you can do about that. The only thing that you, you should then want to do is to have the kind of interactions with, with such a country that helps your own situation. We are telling students, learn this language, learn this culture. And, and, and culture is, is both ways, you know. They also understand African culture because they will be working with us they are in our country and that way i think because of the mutual aspect of it i think kenya will gain quite a lot from uh, interacting with china uh, with china in the next uh, five ten years Again? 
I am Ezra Mbai. I have been studying Chinese for two years and now I am preparing for my HSK test. And it's actually been offered for free here at the Confucius Institute. Because of China's increased presence in the country, there are a lot of young Kenyans learning Chinese at the moment so that they can have better career opportunities. We get in touch with Ezra a young, ambitious student that has been studying Chinese as an extra language. Chinese language at the university is offered for free. So I took up the opportunity and then I told them I'm doing Chinese because it's being offered for free at the university. And they said, yeah, no problem with that. Yeah. And most parents are encouraging their children to study Chinese language. And then a teacher carries a chalk and a stick. And the teacher is a person who has already graduated. This one, the hat. And then these ones are like the hands, like this, which is one is carrying like a book. And then this now, this is the, the body, like that. So you see, there's this character over here. So they are able to understand this is a character that they have. Because if you look at Chinese, um, the Chinese uh, lecturers, they only teach you, okay, ni hao, hao, like that. And then, they leave it at that, you see. So the students, they, they have that habit of now, they will memorize, they will try to cram the character instead of trying to understand it and even relate to the character. In the evening hours, there's dancing at the Confucius Institute. Many students take extracurricular dance and singing classes.是我教的就是觉得中国舞蹈和肯尼亚舞蹈的区别舞蹈和音乐，然后到时候把它融在一起，这样的话，他们既能学到中国舞蹈，然后又能展示自己国家的文化。finishing my studies uh, and then maybe do the exam, HSK test exam. I probably get a chance, to, I would love to experience China through my own eyes. Uh, yeah, rather than hear, hear about stories, different hearing stories about China. I love to go to China. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, it's part of my bucket list. <laughs> when you learn language, you also learn uh, or you pick up aspects of culture and that helps you to understand uh, the, the, the other peoples much, much better. You find that actually once you have understood them, maybe understood aspects of their culture, then you find that they're very much uh, basically like you. And therefore you can be able to uh, then interact and solve problems that, that I call therefore universal. One of the problems we've seen here is that some Chinese have difficulties with localizing. When we were driving through Nairobi, we see that there are many apartment complexes being built by Chinese developers. We have a talk with George and Monica, who are involved in marketing these apartments to local clients. Although the apartments look luxurious from the outside, sales have actually been below expectations. 
The problem is that the designs and the outfitting are a direct copy from what Chinese apartments look like and not localized to Kenyan standards at all. Well, I guess most of them, their mother companies or headquarters are in China. And that's where they get the finance approvals from. So everything is done in China. Even when you look at the plans, they're in Chinese, you know? So for that reason, I think, you know, you, you, they, they don't, the guy designing them in China has been given the space and told, give us 60 units out of this. But they don't know, you know, um, how the local setting is. Unless they came here and learned the culture of the people. That's when it would make sense. You see this? My dining room table cannot fit here. My fridge cannot fit here. <laughs> so I'll need the whole of that for my fridge. You know? That space, I'll need it for my fridge. I need a four burner. You know, in, uh, we cook a lot. We need four burners. Yeah? And, um, yeah, and then we need more storage. You know? I need this to be my level, my height. You know? So those are the small things that make it a hard sell at $300,000. It makes it a really hard sell. When people came to purchase, it was still a shell. It was not something complete like this. So it was sort of off plan. So people had not seen what they are getting themselves into. So after that, there, was, uh, there were issues. The kitchens were too small, so they had to do changes. And there was a lot of, oof, it was just a lot of, what can I say, too much drama. This is, you know, this is not wood. This is not wood at all. It's just laminated still. Yeah, so we have come to see wood, wood. This is, and we, we, yeah. We, you, you, we're gonna hear everything. <laughs> we're gonna hear everything. And you're, you're forgetting and the, the smell. Pong, and the pong when you're getting out of that toilet. Yes. And guys so are there looking at you. It's, um, it's a design problem. <laughs> And then the TV is here. And the TV is here, come on. Uh, so it, it's, it's not a good idea. Yeah. That would have been perfect as a study, maybe as a library. Yeah. So yeah. We, we, yeah, like for us Kenyans, the toilet business is very hidden. It's a very private affair. Yeah, yeah. you, you want to give your guests some privacy. Yeah. Maybe I, I think what I need to say is this. I think you need to listen more. Listen more. Yeah, listen more. Listen more. Don't come with that thing of like, this is how it is yeah just listen more and when you listen more you'll definitely go the right way yeah listen to what the kenyans want listen to what you've been told yeah because you cannot force a kenyan to embrace chinese you get what i'm saying when european company like even southeast asian company come here you see a lot of them they will hire consulting companies chinese companies don't Chinese companies won't pay for information and pay for consulting type service. They want to pay for something more practical. This lack of communication between both sides is a common herd problem, where Chinese people are often blamed for not blending into the local culture quite well enough. Instead, they live in their own communities. Bridging this cultural gap is important as China's presence in the country is growing. And there are a few organizations in Nairobi trying to improve this relationship. We meet Hong Xiang, who founded an organization called China House, and we also meet up with Arting, who works at the Sino Africa Center of Excellence. They understand the importance of solving cultural problems like no other. A lot of Chinese companies, they do not really understand how media work, because you need to know in a, as a fact, in Chinese language, propaganda is a positive word, while in English it's not at all. So this simple word reflects a huge communication gap. You, cannot expect like a media, a journalist just come go to a random Chinese and then a Chinese tend to accept this interview. Maybe in the West, if you do that, people's natural tendency is they're more likely to accept this interview. But for Chinese, the natural tendency is going to turn down this interview. Because by in a Chinese way of thinking, you know, disaster comes from mouth. The more you speak, the stupid you are. So why you should do this interview at all? They are afraid of their PR departments will make mistakes. So they're in, in order to avoid mistakes, they avoid interaction with local journalists. So they wanted to promote our company, the developer, 
they want to highlight what we as guys have been doing and then there would have been a probability of us guys you know winning their award which would have really helped so us in terms sure. of marketing mm. and she she couldn't even listen to me even yeah. for five minutes we don't do that yeah. our company doesn't do that <laughs> the the person who can make decision cannot speak very good english they don't want to be on the tv and like speak very broken english um and the person who can speak english but don't have the power to decide what to answer i think the west is not interested in business they're interested in romance because it sounds romantic i mean i want to make money you want to make money that's our objective so why introduce all these complications red tape you know bureaucracy into the process so for that reason i think the west has lost they've, they've, they've lost the fight and for africa right now the best partners are the chinese 我觉得第一点应该是第一个动机应该就是这种motive是其实就是为了经济而来的我觉得我们没有那么高尚我觉得我自己啊我觉得最重要的讲就是说我们来这边比如说我现在雇佣的这么一百多号人和两百号人对不
so and that's where the idea also started of bringing students here like if we are able to bring in young people from china to come and experience the life they they live in nairobi then they travel to kakuma and then they come back there is that personal bond and what we are trying to do is recruit young chinese in china to bring them to africa to do many kind of things to do volunteer to go to the slum and we try to get them to understand more africa and understand better about what china africa relation is and what you should go to and we believe when these young chinese they grow up they go to chinese companies they go to international ngo they go to media and they will really become the new generation of Chinese in Africa. Liu is also part of this new generation. He dedicates his time to run the Dream Building Service Association. So DBSA is a non-profit organization founded by overseas Chinese students. It is based in the Mathari slums and it aims to empower youth by providing them education and after-class activities. Their schools follow a standard Kenyan curriculum, but because DBSA has many Chinese students as volunteers, the children here also learn Chinese. We want to empower as many youths as possible, and uh, we want them to get back to the slum and make Madari better. Yeah. The parents, they have grown. There's not much we can do, but we can do something to change them the children so that they can have a better life tomorrow, they can have, they can have a better secure community tomorrow. That is when Dream Building Service Association was born. We have worked with some foundations in China, so we get their financial support. And sometimes when we're doing the renovation of schools, we also have the, the fundraising program with the Tencent. Yeah. We are visiting the Changrong Light Center. This is one of the schools under the DBSA. David is the school principal. He and Liu work closely together to ensure the children have what they need. The Chinese classes, that is extracurricular. It's not uh, examinable. In Kenya, Chinese is not examinable until you go to university level. Uh, these things have just been bought by this man, Simba. Yeah, he bought them last, last week. So the class is colorful, you can see. Yeah, it's now much better. Yeah. <laughs> These are for meat? We preserve them for meat. We are still, if we can get a market, we can do produce a lot of them. For meat? For meat. Yeah. Maybe you can connect us with the Chinese hotels, oh. so that we produce a lot. Actually, I saw rabbit meat in Naivas. Yeah, in you see? Yeah. Yeah. So they would like to raise some rabbits and so that they can sell it and uh, generate some money, yes. The thing that's different is that we're cross-culture. So I'm not growing up in Africa. You are not growing up in China or America. Yeah. Yeah. So we see different things. But then like at the end of the day, we still share the same kind of rights. We still share the same kind of faith that we all want to like do something for the community. Yeah. People that are yearning to improve their living standard, they are yearning to, to improve their economic standard, they are yearning to improve their educational level, everything. So people who come just to give them that small ray of hope, it's possible. Those are their friends. <laughs> Like this? You like it? Yeah. Okay, I will teach you. Myung Yue. Write it down. This is the moor. This is the moor. Like like this. This 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 character come from this. The moor, right? But if you pull two stick here, it like the same. Anyone else want to try? 
You see more and more younger Chinese people, they are more open, more international. They can serve as a bridge because on one hand, they usually understand the Chinese communities because they are Chinese. On the other hand, they usually have a very international background. They can get to understand NGO, foreign media, and so on. I, the questions I keep asking myself is like, what makes me special as a Chinese being in Nairobi? And most of the time, I don't see it. I see it that I'm a Chinese people to a Chinese person doing nonprofit here. That's because like I'm brought up in China. I am nationality, I'm Chinese. The focus that we get from the press, the support we get from our friends and families and a larger society, yet it is helping. But um, you know, a lot of times I want them to help not because that I'm a Chinese. They want them to help because they genuinely think that the work that I do it's good. After spending just 10 days in Nairobi, we already saw the indisputable influence that China has on Kenya across business and education. While some of these developments can obviously cause social friction, it is the younger generation that have already started looking past their differences. They focus on what can be achieved by working together and embracing each other's culture. China is rapidly growing their global footprint with strategic investments across the world. And the side effect is that the language and the culture are getting more exposure. If you look back at the map again, you can see that Kenya is only one of the many stations in the One Belt, One Road initiative. The international dynamics will surely change when progressively more developing countries cooperate with China to advance themselves. But what will the cultural side effects be? And how will the attitude towards Chinese evolve when this new generation of Chinese expand their impact across the globe? Now that it's settling into a more prominent role on the world stage, it will be this new generation that is going to change the face of China in the coming decade. Ni hao, 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 ni hao